All right. Good afternoon. Uh, today's topic is uh, deep learning again, but this time deep learning for generative modeling. So we're going to talk about the combination of deep learning and probability uh, distributions. And before we start, because we're talking about deep learning today, a couple of tips for the people doing deep learning projects. Uh, the first is that deep learning, of course, is a um, requires a lot of uh, what we call compute, which means by which we mean computing power. It helps have a GPU, which not everybody has, uh, and you need a lot of data and then a lot of time to process all that data. So uh, for a student project like you're doing, that's not usually feasible at a large scale. So one good trick to sort of um, use a lot of work that other people have already done is uh, transfer learning where basically you take one of these models that uh, a company like Google has trained on a large data set. Uh, you can download those models. This is VGG, which is a very old one, but you can also do uh, ResNet or something like that. And what you can do is you can reuse those weights and retrain them on your own data. So you just remove the last couple of layers, stick on your own layers and train only those layers. You freeze the weights for the whole network and you train only the last couple of layers on your data. That's called transfer learning. It's very easy to do both in Keras and uh, PyTorch. And it allows you to sort of have your cake and eat it too. So you can use these very big models without fully training them from scratch. Uh, so if you're thinking about doing a deep, or if, well, you've chosen already, but if you're doing a deep learning pro project, this is a, a, a trick you might want to consider. And if you just Google transfer learning plus Keras or Transfer Learning plus PyTorch, you'll see how to do it. Uh, second tip is uh, when you're doing deep learning is to look at your loss curves. So if you're doing deep learning, stochastic gradient to send you feed a batch to your model and you get a loss over that batch. Um, plotting that loss as training progresses gives you a very good indication of what your network is doing and how it's moving through this loss landscape. So what you see here is uh, four different, or the same models, the same model trained with four different learning rates. So we're doing hyperparameter optimization for a particular model. These are learning rates. And what you can clearly see is that if the, uh, if we set the learning rate to 0 0.05, the orange one, then the model doesn't learn at all because the loss doesn't go down. So you can sort of imagine this as the, uh, gradient descent jumping around this loss landscape and not sort of jumping over the uh, the values that it needs to go down because it's the steps that it's taking are too big. And then as you see, if we lower the loss, uh, the learning rate a little bit with the dark blue here, you get a very nice curve down into a lower loss regime. Uh, same with the red, actually the red is the best one here. So it very quickly drops to a loss. And then we see that if we put the loss too low, so four zeros and a five in the light blue, uh, the loss does drop, but it sort of gets stuck in lots of local minima, and it never quite gets to the properly low loss. It never quite punches through to the lowest part of the loss landscape. So this is just to say that if you're training deep learning models, this is what you're doing most of the time. You're tuning your hyperparameters by looking at the loss curves during your training session. There's a lot of tools. Uh, this is plotted in TensorBoard, which is probably the most popular tool for investigating your loss curves. So if you're doing a deep learning project, uh, this is a good, uh, good thing to do. So that's just for the people doing deep learning projects. Uh, so having said that, let's get to the main topic of today, which is uh, deep learning for generative models. So we're going to train deep learning models from which we can sample rich data. Uh, the main structure we'll use for that is a generator neural network, which we'll explain in some detail. Uh, then we'll look at the first method for training these generators, which is called a generative adversarial network. And the break. Then we'll look at autoencoders, which by themselves encoders. 
which by themselves are not necessarily primarily a way to train generative models. They're really more of a dimensionality reduction method like we saw like PCA. But what we'll see is that we can actually interpret them also as a generative model. And that perspective, if we tidy it up a little bit, leads us to the variational autoencoder, which is a particular twist on the autoencoder. Uh, that's where most of the uh, deep mathematics is in this lecture, but it's worth it because we get a really nice principled way of uh, training generative models out of it. Uh, but that's all at the end. We'll start with generative adversarial networks. And generative adversarial networks are the models that are uh, responsible for this uh, slide that I showed you in the first lecture. Like I said then, these people don't exist. This is uh, generated, these were generated by a neural network which was trained on a data set of lots of people. And after training sampling from that data set, gives you faces like this. And you can go to a website called, I think this person does not exist.com, and every time you go to that website, it'll generate a face for you like this. So how does that work? Well, step one is we need to figure out how to make a, gener uh, make a neural network produce random data. How do we turn a neural network into a um, probability distribution from which we can sample? That's step one. Uh, most of this, uh, the first part of this lecture will be visual. Uh, there's not a lot of mathematics. So this is my the two pieces of shorthand that I'll use to explain what we're doing. On the left, we see a, uh, uh, a thing that represents a neural network. So we don't really care what happens inside the neural network. It can have lots of layers. It can have convolutional layers or fully connected layers or layers that we haven't really talked about yet. We don't really care, but it has some input, which is a tensor, and some output, which is a tensor. And we'll draw it like this. We don't really care what happens inside. We, it has some weights, and we can change these weights. And then the second ingredient we need is, the, uh, is a uh, standard distribution, uh, which we'll draw like this. So these are the axes of the space, and this is the sort of circle of uh, equal likelihood. This represents for us a multivariate normal distribution. Uh, and if it's circular and centered like this, I usually mean the standard multivariate normal distribution, so the one that's centered at zero and has covariance in every one in every direction. Um, so that's the visual language we'll use. Now the question is, how do we turn a neural network, which is very, uh, which is simply a deterministic function, doesn't do anything random, it just takes the input and for the same input produces the same output every time you run it. How do we turn that into a probability distribution? There's two ways. Option one is to take the outputs of the neural network and to interpret them as the parameters of a probability distribution. So for example, the parameters of a normal distribution. So we just let it produce a bunch of numbers. We interpret those numbers as the mean and the covariance of normal distribution, and then we do something with that. And then we have a probability distribution, right? A uh, Couple of technical details that will be important as we move along. First off, if we do it like this, we have a mean vector and a covariance matrix then the second part will get very big, because it's a matrix, so it's the square number of um, uh, the size of this, uh, this mean vector. So that's a bit much. So what we do instead, usually, is we parameterize the covariance with a diagonal matrix. So we don't do a full covariance matrix for this uh, multivariate normal distribution. We just assume that it's a diagonal covariance matrix which means we can parameterize it with a vector that is as long as the mean vector. So we need as many numbers to parameterize this matrix as we do to parameterize this vector. Or alternatively, you can also think of this as a bunch of one-dimensional Gaussians. That's, a, that's equivalent, that's the same thing. So we have a bunch of Gaussians here, and for every Gaussian, one-dimensional Gaussian, one-dimensional normal distribution, we have one corresponding variance. You can also think of it like that. Uh, so that's just to keep the number of parameters down. So what does that look like, for instance, if we're generating images? In general, one image uh, consists of a bunch of numbers, one number for every channel of every pixel. So that's this 
a big vector which we can reshape into a three tensor, as we saw in the last deep learning lecture. So for the mean image, we output a big vector that we reshape into this three tensor. And for every mean, every value in the mean, we have a corresponding variance. So we generate a vector from the same size of variances. We also reshape that into a three tensor. And this represents what we think the pixel value should be. And this rep represents how uncertain we are about those pixel values. So for one particular pixel in your image, let's say the bottom, bottom uh, right one, your neural network outputs a one-dimensional distribution with a particular mean and a particular var variance. And usually we model these pixel values as values between zero and one. So on this space between zero and one where we know the true value needs to be, the neural network produces a uh, normal distribution that gives us uh, the space of the likely values. And that's not, this might seem a little bit confusing, but it's not very new, it's something we've seen already. Uh, when we were talking about classification in neural networks, uh, for binary classification we usually put this um, linear regression layer on top, which we interpret as the probability of one of the classes. And if we do uh, multi-level classification, we use a softmax layer, so we get a bunch of probabilities that sum to one, and we interpret those as the class probabilities. So these are also the output layer of a neural network parameterizing a probability distribution. On the left, the Bernoulli distribution, on the right, a categorical distribution. So it's nothing new, we just feed the neural network forward and whatever comes out, we interpret that as a probability distribution. Um, this doesn't yet lead to very interesting images because this is a normal distribution. So in the space of all images, we just get one mean and then around that a ball of um, probability mass saying this is probably the image we're looking for. Uh, but we don't get a lot of variety. There's still one mean, there's still one particular image that this neural network outputs. For a more interesting shape, we need to go to option two which is to put the randomness at the bottom of the neural network, by which I mean that we start by start with some multivariate normal distribution, usually the standard one. We sample a vector from it. So this is some high dimensional distribution, let's say 256 dimensions. We sample one vector from that distribution. We feed that vector to the neural network. And then we look at what comes out. So the randomness is at the start, and then we feed that to a neural network. So let's see what kind of distributions we get then. Here's a little experiment. We start with a two-dimensional input, just so we can plot it. So this is a neural network. The first layer is, uh, the input layer has two nodes, two-dimensional input. Output layer has two nodes, two-dimensional output. And then there are 12, I think, uh, hidden layers with 100 nodes each and ReLU activations. Uh, which I haven't trained. So I just randomly initialize the neural network the way that uh, Keras initializes this network, and I see what distribution comes out. So we're not fitting the distribution to any data yet, we're just looking at if we randomly initialize it, what kind of interesting pattern do we see? And then we sample a bunch of points, which will be 2D points, so we can scatter plot them, and that looks like this. Which is quite interesting to look at, and the main takeaway here is this is not a normal distribution at all. So what the neural network does is it starts with a normal distribution and it sort of stretches it and folds it and shrinks it into something that is very complex and decidedly not normal uh, and very interesting. So that's why this kind of approach is interesting because these neural networks allow us to model very complex distributions like the distributions of all images of human faces, for instance. So we can do the same thing for a neural network that doesn't produce 2D points, but produces images. Uh, so here's the shape of the network on the left. So we use something called a deconvolution, which is sort of the opposite of a convolution, but sort of, uh, uh, well, it's sort of a convolution, but the other way around. And we use upsampling layers in place of these max pooling layers that we saw in the last deep learning lecture. And we stack all those together, so then we uh, map one 
So this is basically the structure here is basically the opposite of the kind of convolutional neural network we saw in the last lecture. And we feed it a vector from a sample from a normal distribution and out comes some image. We don't train it, we just look at the images that come out if we randomly initialize the neural network. And again, we see, well, obviously it's not, it doesn't randomly give us a bunch of faces, but it gives us interesting structures. Interesting structures and interesting colors. So presumably, if we start with a neural network like this, and we tune the weights a little bit, we might be able to get, uh, uh, we might be able to fit it to some complicated looking uh, natural data. And of course, you can have the best of both worlds by uh, putting some, uh, by taking a uh, taking neural network, feeding it some random uh, data, and then also interpreting the output as a, the parameters of a probability distribution, uh, which is usually well, what we do. We usually call the input vector in this case Z, uh, which is also called the latent space, because it's a sort of uh, unseen hidden space from which our data is generated, called the latent space. And this is what we call a generator neural network. So this is a neural network that generates complex data. This is the first part of our plan done. And now all we need to figure out is how to fit this neural network to some given data. So we have a probability distribution, a very complicated one. We ha it has some parameters, it has some weights, namely the weights of the neural network. So now we just need to, given some data, we need to figure out how to tune the weights of the neural network so that the stuff that this neural network produces looks like our data. So I'll start with a simple approach just to illustrate why this is difficult. Call that the naive approach. So that's the, the approach that doesn't work. What if we loop over the data? We generate some random output. We sample some output from the neural network. We sample an instance from our data, and we compare the two, see how close they are together by some loss function. Doesn't really matter which one. You can pick mean squared error or something. And then backpropagate that loss. That's something that intuitively seems like it might work. Uh, but it doesn't. It leads to something called mode collapse, which works as follows. So let's imagine this, the blue points, are points that are likely under our data distribution. So these are the likely points, uh, the points that we are likely to see, and our, we want our neural network to generate these points and none of the other points in this plane. Uh, in other words, these are the modes of our data distribution, the likely outputs. We uh, follow the naive approach, so we sample a random point from our data distribution, from our neural network, which is a green point here, and then we compare it to a randomly selected point in our data set. And then we see where it goes wrong, right? So it's done very well. It's, uh, it's generated a point very close to one of the modes of our output distribution, but because we don't know which mode it's approximating, which uh, point uh, yeah, we don't know which point to compare it to. We might compare it to completely the wrong point and pull it in completely the wrong direction. And if we do this a bunch of times and average out all the uh, gradients pulling on these uh, output points, we just end up in the middle. That's what we call mode collapse. So instead of having these uh, eight separate modes, this distribution with lots of different modes and different uh, lots of variety. Instead, the neural network just learns to output the average of our data. So if you're generating faces, you would end up with something like this, just a neural network that for every sample outputs this, the mean face, which is not what we want. We want a neural network that generates specific variety. So we'll look at uh, two ways of solving the mode collapse problem, generate adversarial networks and variational autoencoders. And we'll start with generative adversarial networks. Um, 
So for that, we need to go back to 2014 when uh, these uh, convolutional neural networks, these classification networks that I uh, talked about in the last deep learning lecture were just becoming popular and people were starting to study them. So we had, for instance, neural networks that could really very well detect whether or not an image contained a bust. And so well, in fact, that sometimes they did better than humans. So if you look at all the data, uh, sometimes humans got it wrong and the neural networks didn't. So the accuracy of uh, neural networks was actually at the same level or even better than that of humans. So people started thinking, well, maybe this is actually sort of how humans do it. These, mod these things actually model the way humans see the world. And then there was a sort of uh, fly in the ointment in the shape of adversarial examples. Somebody discovered that it wasn't quite that easy. And the way they did that was by taking one of these classifier neural networks, one of these, let's say, a bus neural networks that you can clearly see in this picture, this is a bus. And it's very good at distinguishing buses from non-buses. And they decided to, instead of training the weights on the classification accuracy, they decided to freeze the weights and train the inputs. So you can do this. Just compute the gradient, not over your weights, but over your inputs. And use gradient descent not to minimize the loss, but to generate an input that is most likely to create the classification uh, bus. So basically, you search the input space for an input that causes the neural, neural network to say, oh, this is definitely a bus. Which is interesting, because then you can sort of, well, see what the neural network thinks is a bus. And it turns out that if you start with random noise, the image really doesn't change at all. The thing that you end up with, which the neural network is sure is a bus, uh, looks like random noise, looks like these noise images here in the middle. And what's more, if you start with an image of something else, and then you apply your gradient descent, uh, the image doesn't really change at all before the neural network thinks it's a bus. Or to uh, follow this slide, so here the target class is ostrich. Uh, so we start with an image of a bus. We apply gradient descent. Uh, so that's the point in input space where we start. We apply gradient descent to make the neural network change the input so that the neural network thinks it's not a bus, but it's an ostrich. And this here, this uh, thing in the middle, is the amount of change you need to apply to the image so that the network thinks it's, it's an ostrich. And the column on the right is the image with that change applied. In other words, we, don't, we can't tell the difference between this bus on the left and this bus on the right. We can't really see the difference. I certainly can't. But the neural networks is 100% sure that the thing on the left is a school bus and 100% sure that the thing on the right is an ostrich. So uh, this was a problem because basically these neural networks, even though they work well on natural classification data, clearly had some blind spots, clearly could be fooled. So that's called an adversarial example. Given a network, you can create an image that completely uh, throws it. So that's a big sort of setback for image classification, but it's a setback that can very quickly be turned around into a positive, because these adversarial examples, if you can generate them automatically, and we can, we have a method for doing that, you can also add them to your data set. You can then retrain your model, after you generate a bunch of these adversarial examples, you can retrain your model and say, you may think this is an ostrich, but it's not an ostrich. And then after you've retrained your model, you can generate new adversarial examples for your retrained model and iterate that process, which gives you not just a far more robust image classifier, but also a better generator, because the images, the adversarial examples you generate get better and better and better. So that's the sort of proto-typical example, the proto-example of the generative adversarial network. You, uh, so let's say you have some binary classification. You train a classifier to tell positive from negative. 
you generate a bunch of adversarial examples, which at first to us are clearly not in the positive class, but the classifier thinks that they are. And you add the adversarial examples to the data as the negative class. And you retrain and you loop. And then the classifier gets more robust and the generator gets more realistic. And that was the start of generative adversarial networks. So we'll look at a couple of examples in a bit more detail. The vanilla GAN is the basic, sort of basic approach to GANs, which has evolved a little bit to make it a bit easier to train. We'll look at how that works uh, first. Then we'll look at conditional GANs, which are uh, GANs that learn a transformation from one picture to another. So here we have uh, uh, an outline image of a bag for which the conditional GAN learns to generate a photorealistic picture of a bag. Or roughly photorealistic. It's not that photorealistic if you zoom in, but from this distance it looks pretty convincing. Uh, so conditional GANs work with paired up data. So if you have your pictures of this bag in outline should look like this bag as a photograph, then you can do a conditional GAN. Sometimes you don't have paired up images. For instance, we know what zebras look like. We have a bunch of examples of zebras. We know what horses look like. We have a bunch of examples of horses. We don't have an example of what a particular horse would look like if they were a zebra. But we know there is some transformation that turns a particular horse into a zebra. So if you have unmatched images like that, you can still train again to make this transformation sometimes. Uh, that's called the cycle GAN. We'll see why. And then finally, we'll look at this style GAN, which was responsible for these uh, uh, especially realistic images of uh, non-existent people. But first, let's start with the vanilla GAN. So we know basically already how to train a GAN. You generate adversarial examples and you add them to the data set. But we can make this a little bit more efficient. Uh, and fit, uh, yeah, we can make this more efficient and more sort of easy to do in a a standard deep learning setting. So we start with two networks. We have our generator network, which uh, we've already described in the first part of the lecture, uh, which may or may not have a probability distribution at the top as well. doesn't matter for GANs. And then we have a discriminator, which basically if we don't have this positive negative binary classification to start with, if we just have a bunch of data, then the discriminator has as its task to classify the image into the class real or fake, where the real images come from the data and fake images are generated by the generator. And then we train in two phases. We either feed the discriminator a real example, which it should classify as positive. So then we have a neural network, we have an input, we have an output, we have a target class, which we can backpropagate. This we can just do with um, cross entropy. That's if the input is a real example. And then we alternate that with fake examples, where we take the generator as it is now. We freeze its weights, so we don't update the weights of the generator at the moment. We feed it some uh, random input. It produces an image here in the middle of the neural network. And on top of that, we stick the discriminator. So now the generator plus the discriminator are one neural network. And the output here, whatever is generated, the output should be negative. So whatever happens at the end of the network, uh, we give it negative as a target class and we backpropagate. So that's how we train the discriminator. And then we alternate that with training the generator, for which we do this big neural network again of the generator, of the discriminator stuck on top of the generator. But then we freeze the weights of the discriminator. So we don't update the weights of the discriminator, only the weights of the generator. And now the target is positive. In other words, we are training the generator to generate samples for which the discriminator thinks that they are positive. So again, we have a neural network, some frozen weights, some output output class, so we can just backpropagate this. And usually what you do is you uh, just do one mini batch of one and then a mini batch of the other. So you don't really wait for any of them to converge. So you do a bunch of batches of one and a bunch of batches of the other. Uh, usually 
one of them, I think the generator needs a couple of more batches, a couple more batches than the discriminator. Uh, so there's a bit of fine tuning there, but basically every batch you alternate. And that's basically the standard way that GANs are trained today. Uh, which is very relatively straightforward to do in a, a, a framework like Python, Torch, or TensorFlow. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay, so the question is, do we get class imbalance? Because uh, we get, at the end, more negative images, I guess. Um, so the class, the, the balance of the classes, I guess, is um, resolved by how many uh, negative examples you generate for each positive example. So here we feed the neural network one positive example, and we train it to classify this as positive, right? And for that one positive example, we can train k negative examples. We can generate k negative examples and train on those. So. If we do one by uh, one for one, we can do one positive example for one negative example. Then it's purely balanced. Practically, I think you want slight imbalance, but I forget which way around the imbalance goes. So in general, um, you have sort of perfect control over the class balance of this classification problem. But it's kind of a hyperparameter that you need to tune. Um, so that's what we'll call the vanilla GAN. Don't know if that's the standard uh, name or something I made up, but within the context of this course, we'll call that the vanilla GAN. Um, but sometimes you don't want to just generate data, you want to generate a, uh, you want to learn a function, which is like a normal neural network, but a function that has some ability to imagine details. So here are a bunch of uh, use cases. So let's look at the top right. Uh, which is uh, the task of mapping a black and white picture to a color picture. Uh, so obviously from color to black and white is easy, which makes it very easy to generate lots of data, but then we want to learn how to go the other way. Uh, if you do this with a normal neural network, uh, you get a kind of mode collapse conditioned on the input image. So the input, you do get a kind of colorization of the input image, but whenever the neural network sees a flower, it has no randomness to, it has no access to randomness with which to make choices, for instance, the choice of what color the flower should be. So when it sees a flower, it has to decide always for that particular flower to, out, to give it the same color, which gives you a kind of mode collapse that ultimately all flowers sort of look brownish, grayish, uh, because that's a sort of safe choice that gives you the lowest loss to all different instances. But what we want instead is for the neural network to pick randomly, uh, basically for every uh, decision that it can make on the basis of the input data, to randomly choose a value. So you want some generation, some randomness to say, for the neural network to say, this time I'm gonna make the flower yellow, this time I'm gonna make the flower uh, blue. So it's a combination of the deterministic neural network and a random neural network. And that's something you can train with a conditional GAN. Uh, look at all the use cases first. So on the bottom right, we see the, the handbags. Again, if you have a bunch of photographs as handbags, then generating their outlines is quite easy. There are standard image filters to do that. And then you can train the neural network to do the transformation in the other direction. Uh, there's transforming pictures of day into transforming pictures of nights, transforming pictures of street maps into satellite photographs and back. Uh, building facades from, uh, yeah, so the, the top left and the top middle are what we call 
uh, semantically uh, segmented images. So they are colored by, the objects are colored by what type of objects you see. So on the data set on the left, all the cars are colored blue, the road is always colored purple, and so on. Uh, so if you go from the photograph to the uh, semantic segmentation, that's just a kind of pixel classification task. But if you go the other way around, you're basically asking the neural network to imagine a street scene. So the cars you see here are imagined cars, and the same with the building facade. So that for this, we need a conditional GAN, which works pretty straightforwardly. It's, uh, like I say, a, a function of some input to some output, in this case, both images, which also has access to some randomness. And we won't look into exactly how you wire up this neural network, but basically some randomness goes in together with uh, the input. And from the outline of a shoe, in this case, it generates a realistic photograph of a shoe. And that's our generator. Now we need some GAN training, again, in two stages. So when we're training the generator, we feed it, uh, let's see, uh, when we're training the generator on fake images, we feed the shoe, the outline of the shoe, through the generator. It generates a realistic photograph of, of a shoe uh, together with the input, together with the outline of the shoe. And then the task of our discriminator is to take these two images, a pair of images, and tell us whether they were fake or not. So the discriminator tells us whether this photorealistic shoe was generated from this outline of a shoe. And then if it's a fake image, if it's a generated image, the label is fake, so it should classify that as fake. And if it's a real pair, which is actually from the data set, then it should classify that as real. So that's pretty straightforward, and that's just, uh, that's enough to train these, uh, these classifiers and to give you all these, uh, these examples. But that's only if you have paired up images. If you say, this outline of a shoe should look like this photo of a shoe. In other use cases, you don't have paired up images. You just have a bag of images of one type and a bag of images of another type. Like the zebras and horses that I already talked about, but also we might have a bunch of paintings by Monet and a bunch of photographs of the French landscape that look like Monet would have painted them. But we don't have examples of what those look like if Monet did paint them. So then the question is, can we still learn this transformation somehow? And the uh, solution to that was the cycle GAN, which is a bit of a, uh, a bit more complicated, but it's using the same principle, same ingredient. Uh, the first thing we have to say is that we always train the transformation in both ways. So the conditional GAN was just a transformation in one direction. Cycle GAN is always both ways. So we always learn a horse to zebra generator and a zebra to horse generator. And then we learn in both domains, we also learn a discriminator. So the discriminator now uh, doesn't work on pairs of images. The discriminator works on single images. So it looks at a, we have a zebra discriminator that tells us that learns to, to, to say whether something is a fake zebra or a real zebra. We have a horse discriminator that learns to say whether something is a fake horse or a real horse. And then we have these uh, generators into one domain and from, into the other. And then we train them by uh, arranging them in a cycle, which is like we call the cycle again. So we'd start with a real image of a See, G is horse to zebra. So we start with a real image X of a horse. We map it to a zebra. And then we map it back, map it back to a horse. And then, uh, obviously, we train the discriminator to recognize that this is a fake zebra, that Y hat is a fake zebra. But we also add a term to the loss for how far away we end up from where we started. So we end up at the end of these two steps with a new picture of a horse, which is some way removed from where we started out. And we add a loss term for that as well. So uh, not only should it generate a 
a realistic zebra, it should always also re generate a realistic zebra that maps back to the horse it started out with. And the same way with the uh, zebra to horse generator. So why does this work? I think the most intuitive explanation is you can think of this as the generators practic practicing what's called steganography, which is sort of hiding codes in plain sight. So if I want to send somebody a, a secret message, I might send them a realistic looking letter and then hide in the shapes of the letters or in the shapes, uh, the way I've arranged the words, I might hide a secret message in something that looks innocuous. So basically what we're doing is trying to hide the picture of the horse in something that looks like a picture of a zebra in such a way that the zebra discriminator cannot tell that we've hidden a horse inside of it. But the cycle loss, the cycle consistency loss, ensures that once we get uh, that from this picture of a zebra, we can actually get the original picture of a horse out. So in this transformation, horse to zebra, we shouldn't lose any information that was in our original picture. We want the original picture. We want to be able to decode the original picture from our zebra picture. And that together, uh, for some domains, allows us to do unmatched, uh, learn unmatched image transformation, like these. So last scan, just to show you how these uh, realistic images were, these uh, images of people were generated. This was done with a style GAN, which is just structured just like the vanilla GAN, so we don't do any fancy training, any conditional training, any cycle losses. We just take the um, vanilla GAN approach, but now we're going to look into the structure of this generator network, which for the style GAN is quite uh, elaborate. So we have in the middle here, we have a basic stack of deconvolutions, like we saw earlier, this uh, inverse of this uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, which is fed some latent vector, it's a, ge it's a generator, so some latent vector goes in, but instead of feeding it in just at the bottom, we feed it in at every layer. So at every layer we map it through a uh, linear transformation to reshape it to whatever size the image is at that point, and then we add it to the image. Actually we use it in this case as a kind of um, adaptive normalization, which is something I won't go into, but more or less we just add it in to the neural network at that point. Uh, so the latent factor that we sampled uh, influences the generation of the output image at every step. At every step the neural network looks at uh, what are we generating, oh right, we were doing this. Uh, that doesn't contain a lot of information, these are I don't remember, something like 512 dimensions or something. Um, and if we want to generate realistic images with lots of detail, we need to make a lot more random choices. So for that, the neural network also has access to per layer noise. So for every layer, I remember at every layer the resolution increases. So at every layer we generate a little noise image with white noise that we feed into the layer and the neural network uses that to locally make lots of random choices. So in order to see how this operate, what these things mean, we can try a couple of experiments. We'll try two experiments, one for the latent vector and one for the per layer noise. The first is, what happens if we sample two random images and we mix their latent vector? So one we call the destination, one we call the source. They're all sampled from this GAN. None of these people exist again. Uh, but now we generate with the first two layers taken from the latent representation and the second two layers. Actually, it's more than six, so there's a bunch of layers, but the bottom layers and the top layers are used from the, are taken from the destination image, and the middle layers are taken from the source image. Um, or in other directions, so uh, or in other uh, ordering, what happens then? And this is not something we do just during inference, but also during training. So during training, we also train on these combinations to make sure that the neural network, when we do this, learns to gen generate realist realistic examples. So what happens then when we mix the destination with the source, uh, and we inject the source latent vector in the lowest layers, we see this, 
So we see that uh, ethnicity is taken from the destination, gender is taken from the source, uh, whether some or not somebody is wearing glasses is taken from the source, hairstyle is broadly taken from the source, but also made to fit the ethnicity. So what we see here is that the uh, neural network has decided that if this guy were Hispanic, he would clearly have a beard and long hair. Um, so we're mixing on a very high semantic level, basically. And if we go to the middle, we see that more information is uh, taken from the source, uh, sorry, from the destination. And then at the top layers, we see that really the only information taken from the source is very superficial information, like hair color or skin tone. But the basic shape of the head and the face, the direction, the expression, it's all taken from the uh, destination because that's where the lower, that's all decided in the lower layers. So that's sort of what this, um, applying the latent vectors at different steps in this hierarchy, what that means. Now let's look at the other side of the network. This, uh, these, what, what's the neural network using these noise vectors for, these noise inputs? Which we can try very simply just by changing it. So we start with some generate the image. And for one layer, we change the noise and see what, what changes in the image. So here we change the noise for the top layer. And what we see is that we still see the same person. And if you zoom out, you don't even really see what's changed. But when you zoom in, you see that the details of the hair change. So it's the same guy, same hair color, same sort of messy hair. But exactly in what way the hair is messy, which sort of hair lies on top of which other hair, uh, that decision is based on the random noise set in on the right of the network in this uh, per layer noise. And the same for this uh, kid. So it's you, the neural network needs, a lot, need a, needs access to a lot of randomness because it needs to make a lot of random decisions like how to generate particular messy hair. And by feeding it a lot of per layer noise, uh, feeding it a lot of noise per layer, we allow the neural network to use that noise for all these random decisions for surface detail and to use the latent factor for the more meaningful semantic uh, decision. And then there's a lot of other stuff for the style again that you need to do. You need to grow it progressively. Uh, you need a particular kind of normalization. So there's a lot of stuff going on that I won't talk about, but I think this is the most important uh, part of the structure of the neural network. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff I haven't discussed about GAN, so I don't want you to think, wow, that looks easy. Uh, but I mean, I do want you to think that, but it's also very tricky to actually do. So there's a lot of stuff when you're training GANs that you have to take into account, uh, like what distance function you use, what how you penalize it. Um, so if you decide to go into this and actually train a GAN, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot to read up on. Uh, so now we have this generator that GAN's done. So one more thought to go into the break with. What can we do with it? Apart from sampling data, obviously we can, oops, sorry, we can generate new data, new data. What else can we do with this generator? So these two, data manipulation and dimensionality reduction, requires a second network that actually maps into the latent space, which again doesn't give us. Again, only gives us a mapping from the latent space to the data space. But one thing we can already do is interpolation. So we can look at this data space and see how it's laid out and what's in there. So here's our latent space with the neural, uh, with the uh, standard uh, normal distribution on top of it. If we generate two points, bottom left blue point, top right blue point, we can draw a line in between and we can decode all the points along that line. We can feed e every point along that line into the generator and see what happens to the output. And what we see then in the output is a gently changing, uh, a gentle change from one image to the next, to the other. Where, because we're in this latent space and we're in the, the space of part of the latent space that is supposed to generate realistic images, every picture in between should generate a realistic image, should generate something that should, could have come from our data. 
So what you see with this interpolation is that you can sort of transform from one person into another person through, uh, yeah, uh, where all the intermediate uh, people are realistic. And if you have four points, then you just draw a quadrangle and you can interpolate every point on that quadrangle. So you can interpolate between four people, uh, do an interpolation grid. grid. Um, skip that slide because we're running late. But now we have these two other things that we might like to do, which is data manipulation and dimensionality reduction. And for that, we need to be able to map into the latent space as well as from the latent space to the data space. And that's what we'll talk about after the break. Uh, so let's take 15 minutes and then uh, talk about autoencoders. All right, so let's get back to the order of the day. Um, just a little image to show you that it doesn't always work. There are some failure cases. Uh, but in general, these GANs work quite well. Um, yeah, but what we saw before the break is that GANs, even though they give you a nice generator network with a beautifully laid out latent space like this, they don't give you a way to map into the latent space. Uh, and that's where autoencoders come in. So we'll start with a very simple basic autoencoder. So forget all about generating data for now. We'll get back to that later. For now, we'll focus on autoencoders as a dimensionality reduction method. So if you remember back to principal component analysis, which was a way of reducing the dimensionality of your data, autoencoders are a kind of nonlinear way of doing that using neural networks. So basically, we structure a neural network like this, like a, a, an hourglass. Uh, so something happens in the first part, which we call the encoder, and something happens in the second part, which we call the decoder. It can be anything. Again, we don't really care what happens in uh, the intermediate layers there. But the one thing that we need to ensure is that there's a bottleneck. So one of the middle layers needs to be much smaller than the input. Uh, so that's called a bottleneck arc. So it must pass through one layer where the, uh, which has much fewer nodes than the input and the output. Because what that allows us to do is to train purely, uh, train the neural network purely uh, in terms of how well it reconstructs the input. So we build one of these autoencoders. We call the bottom network, the encoder, the top network, the decoder. We have this middle layer, which is smaller than the uh, other layers. The input and the output layers are the same size. We feed it some input image. Some image comes out at the start when we've just started training. Uh, that's just uh, some arbitrary looking picture. And we compare that to the thing we put in. And we minimize their distance. So it could be squared error loss or something else. Uh, somehow we measure how different these two things are, and we try and minimize that difference. So now we have a loss function, we have a target, and we have an output, so we can just backpropagate. And after a while, we will train this neural network to give us good reconstructions, despite the fact that it had to pass through this uh, sort of narrow bottleneck. So let's imagine we have a bottleneck of just two nodes, H1 and H2. Then we could plot, if we had that, and it works well, we get good reconstructions, then we can plot those uh, we can plot the data al according to those H1 and H2 coordinates. And what we want to see, ideally, if this dimensionality reduction works well, is that similar data ends up at similar spaces in the latent space. So one thing you might see, for instance, is that non-smiling people will cluster together and smiling people will cluster together. And in two dimensions, you can't really cluster people together in very many different ways. But if you have more dimensions, like uh, hundreds of dimensions, then anybody can be next to anybody else. And you can cluster along, uh, you can cluster by expression, by gender, by ethnicity, by hairstyle, by facial orientation, that kind of thing. You can cluster by all these things because you have a, a high dimensional space. So that's ideally what we want to see in this low dimensional space. We want to see meaningful clusters emerge in the data or meaningful directions. So let's start training this neural network, this autoencoder, purely to reconstruct. So this is what it looks like after five epochs. 
our reconstructions. So we can sort of see the ghostly shades of faces emerging. Uh, it hasn't really learned to generate much different color yet. Uh, it focuses on, on dark and light first and then on color later. Uh, then after 25 epochs, we see different colors emerging and pretty clear faces, although quite fuzzy faces. And then as the training progresses, things get more clear and more distinct. It's not quite at the level of this style again yet, but uh, we're seeing pretty uh, good reconstruction. So this is after 300 epochs, you can see that um, if you don't look too closely, it's almost perfect reconstruction. And if you do look closely, you see that the reconstructions are a little bit fuzzier, because remember, we're compressing the data. So all of the information has to be in, in, in uh, 256 numbers. Um, so we can't expect a perfect uh, reconstruction, but it's clearly reconstructing the uh, salient aspects of the data. And this is fully unsupervised. All we need is a bag of images. No training labels required. Um, so that's an autoencoder. And there's a bunch of interesting things you can do with an autoencoder. Um, but one, one thing in particular that's interesting is you can now manipulate your data. You can use this principle of interpolation together with this mapping that we now have into a latent space to manipulate your data. So one example is if you want to make somebody who is frowning smile, all you do is you grab a, a small number of images. So I took uh, 20 images for each class, 20 images of smiling people and 20 images of non-smiling people. So here you need a tiny little bit of labeled data, but not much. It's easy. Uh, it takes five minutes, basically, to label this much data. You map both of them to the latent space. So we map our non-smiling people to the latent space and our smiling people to the latent space. They end up here. We can take these clusters and average them. So find the mean point in, that, uh, in those uh, clusters. So you get the mean non-smiling person and the mean smiling person. And then we can work out what the vector is that connects those two classes. So we draw an arrow from the mean non-smiling to the mean smiling person. And we call that the smile vector. Which basically tells us that if we take an image and we move it in this direction, what we should see is a person, uh, a non-smiling person change to a smiling person. So starting anywhere in space, but adding bits of this vector should slowly change the non-smiling person to a smiling person. So that's an algorithm to make somebody smile using an autoencoder. We encode, we take an image X, we encode it to the latent space, which gives us an, a vector Z. We add a little bit of this smiling vector, which gives us a second latent point Z smile. And 0 0.2 is just, uh, we have to tune a little bit, find, find what value works. Uh, and then that second point, which we've moved around in the latent space, we decode it, and that should give us a smiling person. So here's what that looks like for our autoencoder. Uh, for uh, six randomly chosen people in the data set, some of them are smiling a little bit already. Uh, the, uh, it goes from, the, the value I added goes from minus one to plus one, so the people in the middle broadly are the original data points. And moving to the left makes them smile less, and moving to the right makes them smile more. So it's a very simple neural network structure that allows you to manipulate your data uh, on a sort of semantic level, using very little labeled data. So it's a very nice approach if you have a lot of uh, unlabeled data, but no labeled data, and uh, if you still have five minutes to label a handful of images of one class and a handful of images of the other class, then this kind of approach can, uh, can really work for you. Um, but that's autoencoders. That's dimensionality reduction, uh, data manipulation. But today's main topic was generators. So can we turn this thing into a generator for our data? Uh, yes, obviously. Uh, so we train, uh, the way to do that is to train an autoencoder. Uh, we encode all the data into a latent variable set, so we get a big cloud of points in this latent space. We can then fit a distribution to that cloud of points, 
there's no guarantee that that distribution is normally that that cloud of points is normally distributed, but we can just fit a distribution to it, like a standard normal distribution. And what we can then do is sample a uh, point from that normal distribution and decode that point. So it's a very ad hoc way of creating a generator. We're not feeding uh, standard normal points into the generator anymore. We're feeding points uh, along a distribution that is skewed into the generator, but it still gives us a distribution that should look like our data. Uh, so here's the example. Um, just plotting just the first two dimensions. So the blue points are a bit faded, but uh, there are some very light blue points. Those are our data points. So we get those by feeding our data to the encoder. We get all these blue points. We fit a normal distribution to those blue points, which in this case happens to work quite well because it looks quite normal as it is. And then we sample a bunch of point with points from that normal distribution, which are the red points. So we get a bunch of points in latent space. We map those points through the decoder to the data space, which gives us generated faces that look like this. So again, it's not quite the quality of the style again, because uh, it's a smaller model and uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of randomness to play with. So you can see that the, all the background details and the details in the hair, they sort of get fuzzed out. But the basic ingredients are there, the face is there, uh, the facial orientation, the variety is there, so there's clearly no mode collapse, and we get a nice facial generator. So that's how you turn a, a, a basic autoencoder into a generator, which works okay, but it's a bit ad hoc. We don't really know what we're optimizing. We don't really have any guarantees that this layout in the latent space is multivariate normal. Um, it's too fast, so we have to generate, create the autoencoder first, and then we get a generator. Um, so the question is, can we make this a bit more principled? Can we make this work, but derive the whole thing from first principles? Which brings us to the variational autoencoder. So what we want to do is to force the decoder to, uh, we want to tune it a little bit to, um, give correct uh, samples for the whole latent space, because now we are only training for these specific points that are in the data. We want the distribution to be a standard normal distribution, so we want to train this generator network that we started with, and we want to derive everything from first principles. So a little bit of uh, callback first to the previous lecture. So remember in the previous lecture we saw this hidden variable model which has, uh, we have our observables, our data, x. So every x here is an image. And we assume, by the way we set up our model, that the x is derived from something else, from a thing we don't see, which we call the latent variable, z. And in the, um, what we saw in the last lecture, we did this with the Gaussian mixture model, where the output was a point in space, and the input was a choice of the component of the model. So we see the points in space, we don't see which component generates which point. That's why it's the, the Gaussian mixture model was a hidden variable model. And here we have a similar situation. We have a neural network, which we'll use to model our data. So we're sort of saying, we're assuming this generated our data. We want to fit this to our data. We have the observables, we observe the output x, but we don't observe uh, if we assume that this neural network generated our data, we don't observe which latent uh, vector z corresponds to which output image x. And then we have the parameters of the model, which are the parameters of the neural network. So that's what we want to train, this particular hidden variable model. And like I said, we're going to train it from first principles. And that first principle is the maximum likelihood principle. So all we're going to say is we have our data x, which is our big bag of images. We have our parameters, which is the parameters, the weights of our neural network. And we want to maximize, oh yeah, and our neural network is this one of these generators with a 
probability distribution on top and a probability distribution at the bottom. And we want to find the parameters of our neural network theta that maximize the log likelihood, the log probability of our data. The maximum likelihood principle. And we're going to work that step by step into something that we can actually train using standard neural network uh, training principles. So the first step is to look back to the last lecture at this decomposition. Uh, because remember, we did not, uh, the reason we couldn't easily train a Gaussian neural network, uh, sorry, a Gaussian mixture model, is that we didn't have a mapping, uh, we didn't have, we didn't have complete data. We didn't have for every x which z it was associated with. So what we needed was a distribution on z given x. So we have a distribution on x given z, that's b. We need a distribution the other way around, z given x. We didn't have that, so we introduced an approximation q. And however good or bad that approximation is, this property holds. So we have two terms, so we take the, mac, the log likelihood on the top left there, and we split it into two terms. The term on the right, KLQP, is the KL divergence between the actual P, the distribution on our latent space that we can compute easily, and Q, our approximation. So however good our approximation is, the better our approximation is, the smaller this KL term gets. And then L is some function that expresses whatever is left over. If you do this derivation, you find that L can be expressed like this. At the bottom here, the expectation under Q of the logarithm of the uh, joint probability on X and Z divided by the Q probability on Z given X, which is just that happens to be what's left over. And in the EM algorithm, we could do this alternating optimization where first we optimize one term and then we optimize the other term. Uh, we can't quite do that, but we first follow the same principle. So what we want is a distribution on Z here. We want to figure out, given an X, what Z we should uh, assign it, what Z it came from. But that's difficult to figure out because we would have to invert the neural network. We can compute the neural network from the input to the output, but we can't compute it the other way around. We can't efficiently, we can do it, but we can't efficiently figure out what input would lead to a particular output. So that's why we cannot uh, get this distribution on Z easily. So we introduce some Q, which will approximate that for us. And Q is another neural network in this case. So we have our generator neural network in green at the top. And we just train another neural network which maps X to a distribution on Z. So we have another generator neural network in another direction. So P will give us the distribution on the data given the latent uh, space. And Q will give us the distribution on the latent space given X. And we're going to train both of them in this format. And so you can sort of see this is already starting to look like an autoencoder. So we just train both of these neural networks in such a way that we optimize the uh, log likelihood. And before we move on, you can hopefully see more or less how this solves the mode collapse problem. Because remember, previously when we generated, when we did this naive approach and we generate some data from a neural network, we don't know which uh, element in our data to map it to. So we don't know what to compute the loss to. Whereas if we have this structure, we have a mapping into the latent space and back from the latent space, we can do it like this. We can take a point in our data set, start with a point in the data, map it to the latent space, and then map it back, and then compute the loss between those two points, like an autoencoder. So here you see that even though it generates a point close to this point here, the, uh, the green point that is generated is close to this blue point here, it still knows that this point should actually be closer to this far away blue point here, and that's the loss that's minimized. So that's how it sort of avoids mode collapse. But we're not quite there yet. We don't have a loss function yet that we can backpropagate to train both these neural networks. So now we have to do some heavy rewriting. Uh, in order to do that, we'll simplify our notation a little bit. So we have this Px given Z theta. That's a 
parameters of our neural network. We're never going to put a probability distribution on those parameters, so we can actually put those in the subscript. So the parameters of our uh, green neural network, our decoder from the latent phase to the data, we'll call W. We'll just put that in the subscript there, um, which gives us this distribution of X given Z, which is our decoder neural network, our green neural network. And we do the same for Q. We call those parameters V. And that's our red neural network, which maps into the uh, latent space from the data. So we have two probability distributions. And the important thing is because they are probability distributions, we can only evaluate these uh, functions. We can only evaluate Q, Z given X. We cannot apply Bayes' rule or turn it around or marginalize any of that. It's way too expensive. We can only compute uh, these conditional distributions from the conditional to the output. So we can only compute Q from X to Z, and we can only compute P from Z to X. So let's go back to this useful decomposition of ours. Uh, slightly rewritten now with the new notation. So we have a data set X. We sum over the data set. Uh, all the individual log probabilities of x. That's what we want to maximize, and we want to find the w that maximizes that. Q doesn't come into it yet until we apply this decomposition. So now we apply this decomposition, which tells us that ln, uh, the logarithm of p of x, which remember we cannot compute this because we can only compute uh, p x given z easily. Uh, but it decomposes in these two ways. So Q is a uh, an approximation of the uh, conditional distribution that P gives us on Z, this for which we need to invert the network. So PW here is P's in uh, P's distribution on Z given X, which we can't compute, for which Q is an approximation. KL gives us an indication of how good that approximation is. And L is whatever's left over. So in this case, KL is not a term we can compute. But we do have this L, which looks like this. So it's the expectation under Q of this divided by this. And what we can do now, uh, is instead of taking this whole thing as a loss, we take this first term, this L term, as a lower bound on our loss. So we can't compute the whole thing because this KL term is difficult to compute because it's got this neural network thing that we need to invert. We can't do that. But we can work with just L. L is easy to compute. So we call that our variational lower bound or our evidence lower bound. And we just maximize that instead. So instead of maximizing the logarithm of PWX, we maximize this evidence lower bound term. And because KL is always zero or bigger, the KL divergence is always positive, we know that this L term is a lower bound for the thing we actually want to optimize. So instead of optimizing this L term, we optimize something a lower bound on it. And we hope that that pushes the maximum likelihood, that pushes, pushes the likelihood up as well. There's a little illustration where L PWX is our uh, likelihood. That's what we, uh, our log likelihood. That's what we want to optimize. So this is our, uh, uh, the thing we want to find the maximum of this function over the model space. That's difficult to compute. We can't do that. But we do have this decomposition. And the L term is a lower bound. So that's some function that always stays below. So if we find the highest point on this orange curve, and the difference between the orange and the blue curve isn't too big, then we can be pretty sure that we find quite a high point on the blue curve as well. So this is the decomposition we use. And the L, the KL term, even though we can't compute it or can't efficiently compute it, we can. it helps us think about what we're doing. Because the better this uh, approximation Q is for our inverted neural network, uh, the tighter this lower bound is and the better our optimization. So when we design Q, we should make sure that Q has enough power to represent this inverted neural network uh, accurately. So now we're starting to get close to our loss function. We want to maximize this L. And because we usually want loss functions, we want things to minimize, we take the negative of L, 
and we minimize that so that we can work with uh, things that expect a loss function. So then we do a bit of rewriting. So we fill in the definition of L, which is this, this on the decomposition. We split up the top part, this um, <coughs> uh, joint distribution on X and Z into a conditional distribution of X given Z and a distribution on Z. So that thing on the left is what our neural network computes. X given Z is what our neural network computes, remember. And VZ will see later that that's actually not a problem. Um, so we can work all these factors out of the logarithm so that they become sums and we can work those out of the expectation so that they become terms. So this whole thing simplifies to this. And then we can take the uh, two terms on the right together, work them into the expectation and work them into the logarithm. And we see that they actually express the KL divergence because we end up with the expectation under Q of one distribution on Z over another distribution on Z. So that's a KL divergence. So those two, the two terms on the right together become the KL divergence between our distribution on Z coming out of the encoder network and the prior distribution on Z from the neural network, from the generator neural network, minus this log term on the output of the decoder network. And actually, we know what PWZ is because uh, we constructed the neural network very specifically to sample from a standard normal distribution. So we know that if we get rid of x, if we were to marginalize out x, all we're left with is the distribution on z when we ignore x. And we know what that is. We know that the distribution on z by itself is a standard normal distribution. So this one we can actually just fill in, which gives us this loss function. Uh, so PWZ here becomes the um, uh, standard normal distribution. So now we have something that we can uh, almost minimize. So let's look at these two terms. We have two terms now, a KL term that we want to minimize minus this uh, expectation of the logarithm. Look at the first one first, which basically tells us that this Q network, if we feed it some data, it outputs a distribution. And we want to minimize the distance from that distribution to the standard normal distribution. That's our first law, uh, the first part of our law, which just affects the Q network. And the second part of our loss, which is called the reconstruction loss, which affects the output, uh, tells us that we get some output distribution with these parameters, uh, conditional on Z, so given some Z, we get this distribution. And the expectation of the logarithm of the probability should be maximal for the data. So it should maximize this probability uh, near where the data is which we can almost backpropagate uh, through, except there's this expectation here, which is difficult to compute. So we need to approximate that expectation, uh, which is an easy thing to do. Standard way to approximate an expectation is to sample a bunch of points and take their average. And that gives you uh, an unbiased estimator for the expectation. So we do that. We sample a bunch of points, sample a bunch of these Z points from the distribution that Q gives us. We compute this value that we want the expectation of, the log likelihood, and we take their average. And that gives us an approximation for this expectation that we want. And actually, to keep things simple, we can just set L to 1 and just take one sample from this distribution. Because we're going to train this thing by gradient descent. We're going to update this all the time, so we don't really want to accurate sample, we just, uh, we're going to take lots and lots of samples anyway during this gradient descent. So we want to quickly get some uh, estimator for this expectation that points in broadly the right direction. So we'll keep things simple, we'll set L to 1 and we take one sample from the Z distribution, feed that one sample to the decoder, get a distribution on X, and compute the logarithm on that distribution, uh, compute the logarithm of the probability that assigns to x. So we're almost there. It's almost fully differentiable from top to bottom. We have an encoder. We feed the 
uh, give it some, we show it the data. Encoder gives us a distribution on Z. We sample from that distribution. Z prime is our sample. We feed that sample to our decoder. And our decoder gives us a distribution on the output data, which should maximize uh, the thing we've actually seen. The only problem now, this is all computable and differentiable. The only problem is that we have this sampling step in the middle. And sampling steps are not differentiable. So we cannot compute a gradient down to the values of our encoder. So we need to make this sampling step differentiable. And luckily, in this case, there's a very simple approach, uh, which we, uh, well, the basic idea behind this approach is to take the algorithm that allows us to sample from a normal distribution uh, here. So we have a normal distribution. We take its parameters, and some algorithm allows us to take a sample from that. We work that whole algorithm into the neural network. We've seen, that, we've seen that algorithm before in the uh, previous lecture. How to sample from a normal distribution. It looked like this. Uh, basically, we start with a sample from a standard normal distribution. We figure out some matrix A such that A times the transpose is equal to the covariance of our distribution that we want to sample from. And then we compute a times x plus mu, where x is our standard normally distributed um, sample. And that gives us a sample from the distribution that we're interested in. So that's our basic algorithm for sampling from a multivariate normal distribution. So what we can do is uh, work this algorithm into the neural network. Firstly, we have to worry about this. Uh, a matrix that we have to find, which if we multiply it by its transpose is equal to the covariance matrix that we actually get. Luckily, this is quite easy because we have, uh, we said way, uh, uh, way at the start of the lecture, we said these covariance matrices are always diagonal. So we don't actually mo model the full covariance matrix. We make it the same, we make the parameter the same size as mu, and we only fill in the values of the diagonal. Everything else is zero. And then this decomposition of uh, sigma into A is very easy to do because we just uh, take the square root and we get some other value A, uh, and that gives us the diagonal. So we, basically what we do, instead of making the neural network Q output sigma, we make it output some value A, such that if we square A, we get, uh, we get the diagonal of this covariance matrix. And then all we need to do is this. We sample some standard normally distributed uh, noise, which we can see as one of the inputs to our neural network. So we don't need gradients over that. We don't need to back propagate to this. This is just another input. And we multiply that by A, and we add uh, the mu. So here, these two steps are just multiplication and addition are the um, this is basically the implementation of this random sampling algorithm. That gives us our sample from this distribution mu and uh, defined by mu and a. And now this whole thing is differentiable from top to bottom because we've moved this random sampling, the, the thing that actually does the random sampling, we've turned that into an input to the neural network. And it's just multiplying these things together. And now we have a, whole th uh, a neural network that is uh, differentiable from top to bottom. And this becomes our, uh, our loss function, which we can now implement as a simple feedforward network and train uh, basically as an autoencoder. So the main thing to, uh, to realize here, to note here, is that even though we started with a generator neural network, and the main first question was, how do we train this generator neural network from first principles, just from uh, 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 just to to maximize the data likelihood, we end up with something that looks a lot like an autoencoder. That's why it's called a variational autoencoder. And our loss term looks like this. It has these two. Our loss function looks like this. It has these two terms, which we call the KL loss for the KL term, 
and the reconstruction loss for the uh, uh, PW term. And they're basically, uh, to give you some intuition for how this works, there are basically three forces at work on this latent space. So here's the, we zoom into the latent space of the neural network. And there are three things pulling on this latent representation that we learned for our data. The reconstruction loss pulls this whole distribution that we get on the latent space into one point that gives us the best reconstruction. Uh, so this actually uh, wants the mean of the distribution on Z to move likely away from the middle and towards a particular point. And most, uh, more importantly, it wants the variance to shrink around that point so that as much probability mass as possible is on that point, on this green point here, which gives us the best reconstruction. And that's countered by the KL loss, which is pulling this distribution to the middle and pulling it towards a standard normal distribution. So this, the KL loss wants the mean to be at zero and the variance to be one in all directions, which if the KL loss wins and we get that for all our data points and none of our data points become distinguishable. So it's a kind of battle between a regularizer that wants to simplify this distribution and a reconstruction loss that wants to make it more and more specific. And then there's a sampling step, which ensures that not just the mean, not just a single point gives us a good reconstruction, but also if we add a little noise around, our, uh, around that point, so any, uh, not just the orange point should give us a good reconstruction, but anything in this blue ellipse should lead to a good reconstruction. And we ensure that by sampling. So even though we derived everything from first principles, we have these three fairly interpretable and fairly straightforward uh, forces pulling on our latent representation. Uh, so in the reconstruction loss, we have this LNPX term. Exactly what we have here depends on the output layer of our neural network. So there's a couple of choices. So far we've said the outputs are a mean and a covariance. In that case, the uh, reconstruction loss becomes the log likelihood, or the log uh, probability density under that normal distribution. Uh, and if you fix the sigma, the variance, to a constant, then that reduces to basically the squared error. So you get lots of uh, constant terms that you can throw out. The whole thing reduces to the squared error between what your network outputs and what, you, uh, what your data says, which for images doesn't usually work very well, I should say. So if you're doing this on images, uh, this also called the L2 error doesn't really work very well. Practically, you're better off with an absolute error, so you don't take the square of the, oh, this shouldn't be x, uh, this shouldn't be equals, this should be minus, sorry. Um, so you don't take the square of the difference between the output of your network and your data, you take the absolute value. Uh, that leads to sharper images, and technically means you're parameterizing by a Laplace distribution. Um, but what's even better is cross entropy. So we know that these are values between zero and one. So if we apply the cross entropy function, which you can look back at the previous lecture, you, that means you can apply this cross entropy function, uh, binary cross entropy. Uh, it turns out that practically that converges the quickest. That gives you sharp images and converts very quickly. It's kind of weird, and the distribution it um, it sort of implies that you have it implies you have a particular distribution on the output. There is a distribution that it fits, but it's it's kind of obscure. But hey, if it works, it works. So uh, practically, usually for images, you would use cross entropy. Um, so let's have a finish up by having a look at what comes out if you do this on a, if you use a variational autoencoder instead of a real autoencoder. Uh, here are the reconstructions after 300 epochs of training. Uh, you can see that they look broadly similar. I think the VAE is a little bit fuzzier, but you have to look quite closely. In general, both the regular autoencoder and the VAE give good reconstructions. Then if you generate images, not quite as convincing as I was hoping, but I think in general the uh, AE, the regular autoencoder generated images, are slightly more twisted and unnatural. The VAE has a little bit more naturality, or at least it should have a little bit more natural 
generate the images because we get this sampling step that ensures that uh, we don't just want a bunch of points that, re that reconstruct our data set, we want also all the points in between also to reconstruct our data set. And then finally we can do the smile factor thing, which looks like this. Uh, to be honest, I wouldn't be able to tell you for my example which, uh, which of them are, uh, whether the VA is actually better than the, the regular autoencoder. Um, but there are published papers as well that do this sort of thing. So this is not uh, done by me, but by people with more time on their hands, with more time to fine tune this network and with more compute to throw a bigger network at the problem. So you get this sort of thing. Uh, so here you have this smile factor and they also have a uh, sunglass factor which you can add and subtract to give somebody sunglasses or to take the sunglasses away. I have a little animation here. So you see still quite fuzzy images compared to the GAN, but you do have this mapping into your latent space that allows you to manipulate your data like this. One thing they do have over the GAN is that they work well on data that aren't images. So here we have some sentences. And what you see is that with a regular autoencoder, if you interpolate between two data points, between two sentences, you do get an interpolation, but the intermediate values are not grammatical. So you do not get grammatical uh, sentences as you interpolate from one sentence to the next. Whereas with the VAE, you get an interpolation where every in sentence in between the two input sentences is also a grammatical sentence. So you get actually this nice interpolation where all the steps of your interpolation fit the data. So there you see the value of this VAE, that this interpolation works much better. So here's a little overview image. You can see that the GAN and the VAE have this sort of opposing structure where the GAN has the data space as the middle layer, a generator and a discriminator on top of each other and a VAE, uh, an encoder and a decoder on top of the, each other, and a latent space in the middle. I'll skip these. If you're interested in this stuff, read up on the, uh, uh, the benefits and the uh, drawbacks of each. I already mentioned that VAE is dimensionality reduction, so it's a lot like VCA, so there's these uh, uh, connections. We're running late, so I'll leave it there. I'll thank you for your attention and I'll see you on Thursday when we talk about decision trees. <laughs>